makes them smarter. Here's hoping for time, the lucky charm. You ever feel it when you're talking, you just like going off on tangents? That's been every attempt of doing this video for me. Wish me luck. What's the crack guys? My name's Cassie, and in this video I'm going to be talking about Strange the Dreamer by Lenny Taylor. I read this book last month in April and I filmed a video on it shortly after, but I hated it. Then I filmed another video yesterday, hated it. So this is the third time that I've tried to do this, technically fourth, because I did it twice yesterday. This just book makes me just that I, that I can't talk about it, but I really do want to talk about it because I love this book so much. I bought it before I went on holiday and I devoured it whilst we were there. Anytime I had to stop reading, if we were going somewhere and we were doing something, I had to put it down. I felt bereft. I felt like I was going cold turkey and I just could not wait until I got it back in my hands. And even late at night, I was sitting reading this while everybody was just sharing a wee drink. Also, I was drinking and reading as well. Because why not? I just had to read on in this book. I, it just captivated me from the very beginning, even from just reading the back of the book. But basically, the dream chooses the dreamer, not the other way around. And Laszlo Strange, poor orphan and junior librarian, has always feared that his dream chose poorly. Since he was five years old, he's been obsessed with the mythic lost city of Weep. But it would take someone bolder than he to cross half the world in search of it. Then a stunning opportunity presents itself in the person of a hero called the God Slayer and a band of legendary warriors. And he has to seize his chance or lose his dream forever. What happened in Weep 200 years ago to cut it off from the rest of the world? What exactly did the God Slayer slay that went by the name of God? And what is the mysterious problem he now seeks in solving? The answers await in Weep. And so do more mysteries, including the blue-skinned goddess who appears on Laszlo's dreams. How did he dream her before he knew she existed? And if all the gods are dead, why does she seem so real? I read this when I was in the airport and my mom even read the back of it and made her go cross-eyed because she's not into the fantasy genre, whereas I am. She's very much a very romantic and contemporary reader, whereas I'm like, give me all the strangest things ever. And aside from the fact that the cover is blue and gold and it has this beautifully detailed and elaborate moth design on it, I was hooked from the very beginning. I thought it was signed when I opened it, but every single version I have seen of anybody talking about this book says it's signed too. And even my hardback is signed but it looks the exact same. And then when I turned over the page, I didn't see the, the usual telltale leaking of a Sharpie pen. So that makes me think it's not signed, but it's part of the design of it, you know, with the, the drawings and everything else included. It's just, you know, a reprint of it, but I loved it anyway. It seems pretty cool to think that it is signed. From the prologue, I was addicted. From the first three sentences, I was in love with this book. On the second Sabbath of Twelfth Moon, in the city of Weep, a girl fell from the sky. From the sky. She fell from the sky. What did she fall from? That's what I was immediately hooked by. Her skin was blue, her blood was red. Her skin was blue. The blue skin goddess, has that got something to do with her? She broke over an iron gate, crimping it an impact, and there she hung, impossibly arched, graceful as a temple dancer swooning on a lover's arm. Can you just imagine that? Even just that imagery just caught me immediately girl falling from the sky and then she just crashes on this iron gate and you're like going, what did she fall from did she fall from a plane did she fall from a building did she fall from a cliff where she pushed did she throw herself off did something crumble to make her fall it just like asks all these questions and you're wondering okay what's going to happen next and from those first three sentences i did not let up until i had to finish the book and that's what Lainey Taylor's writing did to me. I'd never read anything by Lainey Taylor before, but after reading this, I'm very intrigued by the next book and then other works by Lainey Taylor. I even have A Daughter of Smoke and Bone ready to go when I get the chance to read it. And her writing style just enveloped me. It just was like, nope, you're reading this. And I had to read it. I just felt like I had to keep going, page after page after page. And even chapters, they weren't ridiculously long. Some of them were even just a page long. And sometimes you're wondering, why dedicate a chapter to a single page but it worked even with a single page chapter you're like okay what's next what's next what's next and her writing style was just so lyrical and flowing that's a big thing for me with writing style it has to flow i hate having to read sentences more than once 
I just love getting the sentence and moving on and getting all the information and just reading and just letting everything just flow over me and just let myself be taken away by that current. You, you're just swept away in it. With that writing style, I was I was hooked to the very wee hours of the morning when I should have been in bed asleep because I work at six o'clock in the morning. With this book, there were times when the action was really getting there and really amping up. There, there was this one particular instance where everything was coming to a fore and I had to read on. I could not put the, put the book down. I could not put it beside me on my bedside table. I had to keep reading and it was at midnight. I was not going to put it down. I had to keep reading on and that's what Lainey Taylor's writing did to me. It just demanded my attention. That is no small feat for a writer. A lot of the times my attention's not that great with books and my imagination's not that great at times. I like to think my imagination is fantastic and great, but it's really not. It does feel me. Sometimes, sometimes I will say that with Lainey Taylor's writing, I wasn't exactly 100% certain of what I was supposed to be seeing. It's not that it was complicated or difficult to understand. It was just that my imagination just could not handle it. Other times I was just imagining something different from a different book or movie that I had previously encountered. Now I'm not saying that this review is going to be like spoiler free, it is not. So if you haven't read this book feel free to leave, I won't hold that against you. But for me it's a lot easier for me to talk about this book if I can just talk openly, okay? So just to warn you from here on I'm going to use some spoilers, okay? So in imagining some things in this book I had a lot of issues with the Citadel at first. After a while I managed to understand what I was actually looking at. Originally, now originally when I first heard about the Citadel above Weep, I was just imagining another city. But then I found out that it was actually an angel with wings spread out. Originally once I heard that it was an angel just standing upright above the city, I was thinking of um, Mega Maid from Spaceballs. I'm pretty sure that's not the imagery that Looney Taylor was trying to convey but that's just the way my mind works I'm sorry but once I understood what I was supposed to be seeing then I got it it worked for me and that was fine and even weep itself with its lushness and whatever Laszlo wants to imagine I had this image in my head of it being a very Roman type city little narrow alleyways going between buildings windows with shutters and things like that and just foliage all over and window baskets and things like that even when the anchors are in the city I was still imagining a very Roman city but like suffering the aftermaths of war and that's literally what Weep is it's suffering the aftermaths of this war between the people and the gods that are above them and the way that Lenny Taylor conveyed the gods was even more intriguing you had the elder gods who took the people from Weep brought them up and used them for their own bidding the women were used to carry their children and the men were used maybe basically to impregnate the woman. They had this very one-sided communication with each other. They just like took them once they reached of age and then they send them back with no memories of what happened because they all have these abilities. And that very much spoke to me about Mrs. Peregrine's home for peculiar children, especially the god spawn themselves. You have Saray, Sparrow, Feral, Ruby and Minya. Now Saray, she's the muse of nightmares. So she has these moths that come out of her and she controls them all, all 100 of them. And they go down to weep and whenever they land on somebody she can go into their dreams and control the dreams and give them nightmares which is what Minya wants her to do. Minya's the eldest of them but she's stuck in a six-year-old's body and she wants revenge on the people of weep. Nobody can control the citadel. The head god could, I can't remember, I can't pronounce his name so I'm not going to but he could control the metal that the angel is made of and I loved that whole imagery of that metal being controlled. I felt it was very Magneto. There's quite a few crossovers in my head between these gods and Magneto and Miss Peregrine's home for peculiar children but then I did say Miss Peregrine's was like excess so yeah. So nobody can move the citadel which is why the God Slayer went forth to all the outlying places to try to find the brightest minds and bring them to Weep so they can solve this problem of how to move the Citadel because it's blocking out all their sunlight. Nobody's going to abandon Weep because it's their home and they can't remember the name that it was given before the name was stolen from them because the gods made them forget what the name was. And so even the people that the God Slayer brought back, like Laszlo, some of them reminded me of some of the characters from 
the Hunger Games particularly Catching Fire. There are two characters that reminded me of ones from Catching Fire. I can't pronounce their names either, but they reminded me of BT and Wyrus from one of the districts, and they're the ones that managed to get the the silks, as they call them, but it's kind of basically like a plane or a hot air balloon, basically. That was another thing. I just couldn't imagine the silks. Um, I was. It's just the words that she uses that I'm just like, okay. The BT and the Wyrus of the group got them up to the citadel but then that's when they discovered that the god spawn were there and that was when the shit hit the fan and i was like oh my god i cannot put this book down a lot of the characters themselves have a great character arc especially saray who's one of the god spawn at first minya wants her to control everybody's dreams and not allow them to forget what happened or what they did to the gods and the god spawn because they killed the gods and the god spawn they killed babies in their cots and they killed children and they killed the staff and the servants. They killed everybody in the Citadel except for these five gods spot. And that's because Minya saved them from the nursery and hid them. But the fact is, what these children are their children. They went up and killed the children, especially the god slayer. He knew that one of those children that he was killing was his own. And so he's not proud of the fact that he's called the god slayer. He's actually quite haunted by that name because he knows one of those was his children. He knows that one of those children was the children of his wife. She doesn't remember giving birth, but she has the physical evidence of giving birth, but she can't remember being pregnant. And so when he killed those children, he killed their children. So he's haunted by it and so is she. And they're in this vacant and distant marriage, but they still love each other, but they can't communicate, which is extremely relevant for today, even in that they have this post-war marriage. And these are two soldiers, these are two warriors, and they can't communicate unless they're on the battlefield. Saray herself, she is the God Slayer's daughter, but she doesn't want to be this malevolent god. She wants to be nice. She wants to be liked. She doesn't want to constantly give nightmares to people. She doesn't want to stay in the Citadel forever. She wants to touch weep. She wants to go down there. And then that's where Lazo comes in because he lets her see a beautiful version of Weep. She goes into his dreams and he gives her this beautiful version of Weep and he can control it, but he can see her in all of the dreams that she has permeated through the years. Not one person has seen her except for Laszlo. And there's a reason why Laszlo can see her and that's because he is God's bod too. He's not shown as God's bod throughout the book because he's a normal skinned person, but the metal that the Citadel is made of, it reacts to him. His fingers, the sculler, because he's God's bod. They don't know that until the end, but at the end, when that was revealed, I was not surprised. It didn't take me by surprise. I was intrigued by it, but I wasn't surprised by it. But then that just makes you want to have another book. It's like, what is this going to tell me? How, how is he gospel? Who's his father? Who's his mother? What's going to happen? That was so intriguing for me. And just going back to Saray again with her character arc, she gains confidence throughout the book. She gains so much confidence against Minya. She goes against her wishes, goes against whatever she wants to do and tries to make friends with the ones down below through Laszlo because he asks the questions and then they communicate in dreams. She tries to save them from the other god spawn when they rise up in the silks. She's like telling them to run, like don't, we don't want to kill you. And at the same time Laszlo's trying to tell them, you know, we're not all god slayers, we don't all want to kill you, we want to be nice, we want to communicate. And even in the dreams, you can see that Saray gets a lot more confidence. She gains a lot of confidence through talking with Laz. That's where she feels powerful and influential. Whereas in the waking world, she's not. Because she, she can't go against Minya because she owes so much to Minya. And then she wants to make sure that the others are safe. She wants to secure the safety of Sparrow, Ruby and Feral. She wants to make sure that they're safe. Otherwise, Minya would take out her fury on all of them. The one thing that I had the slightest niggling issue with the pace and the characters was the romance. There is a romance in it between Laszlo and Saray. Those two fall in love in their dream world and then they're all like, I can't wait to fall asleep so I can hold you in my arms, but I will hold you in my arms in real life. I don't know whether it's me just being 28 and cynical, but I was just want to read past those bits and get rid of those bits. And, Yes, it was nice and it was lovely and it was just so heartbreaking when they couldn't be together and when Saray dies, yes, she's the one that fell from the sky and hit the iron gate. Damn it, I wanted it to be Minya. Why couldn't it have been Minya? Because then there wouldn't have been another book. Duh. But it's just, I didn't want it to be Saray, but at the same time, I'm kind of glad it was because then we wouldn't have so much more mushy stuff. 
That was the only part that slowed down the pacing for me. Just the only slightly little niggling part that held, held down the pace for me. Then when you realise that Saray's essence is tied then to Minya's bidding, then you're like, oh sugar honey iced tea. Because Minya can control spirits and tie her, them to her will. Saray is technically, yes, alive still, but she really now has to do what Minya says. There's nothing she can do to stop that. So she's kind of buggered. With the way that the book ended with the reveal of Laszlo being a god spawn, they really don't know who he is because they don't really even know who these blue skinned gods are. They don't even know where they came from. They just like came from the sky on this citadel. They had previously been encountered and then they came back. They were the ones that defeated the, the demons that roamed the, the, the earth previously and they found the bones of these dead. But then they came back and they were a lot more malevolent and so nobody really knows where they came from, which is where I expect the second book, whenever it comes out, to explore. And then you have to explore where Laszlo was from. How is he God's spot? But Laszlo was not a prince, he was a god, and this is not a game to him. He nodded to Minya and the space where his legend was gathering up words grew longer. Because this story was not over yet. To be continued. I am really looking forward to to whatever happens in the next book and I love this one so much that I did get it in hardback because I have no self-control over this. I saw this in Waterstones and I thought should I get it? Should I not get it? Then I saw this. Blue edges. My favorite color is blue so I had to get this and so I can have this in perfect condition while I lend this one out because I will be lending this out because I will be stuffing it down to people's throats because they have to read it. It is amazing. I wouldn't be lending it to my mum because as I said, not her cup of tea. But to colleagues, to friends, I will be lending this out because it is battered already because this did travel with me. <laughs> this did go on airplanes and car journeys. It's a bit beaten up. It's fine to stay in pristine condition and then I can just pull at it so pretty it's so pretty so i hope this video was very informative for you guys as i said this is like the fourth time i've tried to film this because every time that i talk about this book i just go off on tangents and just ramble on and just talk about stuff that's not really stuff that i want to talk about i just like pretty much tell you what what's what happens in this book and it's it's not very watchable i get bored watching myself when i edit this and so I think you'd get bored watching it and I don't really want that for you guys. I want to make sure it's like quality stuff and then I am getting used to talking about books. Like this is probably like the, the fourth book review that I have done on my channel. Fourth or fifth. I'm not sure but I'm not sure what you're supposed to talk about in these but I'm getting used to it. I'm getting used to talking about it in the way that I want to talk about them get more comfortable talking to a camera usually I just sit in front of it and just do my makeup and there is a makeup tutorial coming for inspired by the cover of this book as well because it's just so gorgeous so once that's up I will have it linked somewhere on the screen so hopefully this was informative for you guys hopefully it means that you will pick it up because it really is worth a read I loved it the writing style is just phenomenal I can't wait to start reading a daughter smoke and bone and I can't wait for the next one so thank you guys so much for watching give it a thumbs up if you liked it subscribe if you haven't already leave comments down below and I will see you in my next video bye